Well, uh, I want to thank uh, Lakeland for actually hosting Community Grand Rounds. It's a terrific way to address you know, issues and have a dialogue about this. Uh, my title of my talk today is How Inequality Kills. A little bit about me, I'm a, I'm a doctor, I'm a primary care doctor, and I've been a primary care doctor for 40 years in Chicago. And I've worked in three institutions, Cook County Hospital, the public hospital, a large safety net hospital called Mount Sinai, and now Rush University Medical Center, literally along one street. And I called my experience One Street, Two Worlds, because I learned about the injustice of inequity through the eyes uh, and words of my patients on one street. And uh, literally, uh, there were two worlds of health and two worlds of healthcare within a mile of each other uh, on that one street. And so this is now, uh, this talk today is going to talk some background material, but I really want us to spend time getting to what can health systems do to address uh, some of these inequities. So I wrote these, I got to Rush as I was invited to come to Rush to be the inaugural chief medical officer after being at these two safety net institutions. And I was so shocked uh, by, the, by the gaps that I saw that seemed to be invisible uh, to the people within my institution. I ended up writing these two books. One was County Life, Death, and Politics at Chicago's Public Hospital, which is about my experience as being a white guy from upstate New York who comes to a public hospital in Chicago uh, and what that was like. But the second book was The Death Gap, How Does Inequality Kill? Because we always think of disease is being transmitted through things like viruses or through our diet and stuff. But actually, inequality kills through exposure to social conditions. Uh, and I'm going to talk, and social conditions transmit or afflict disease uh, just as uh, a virus or an epidemic does. And it's a different way of thinking of health and disease. And so at the end of this, we'll talk about why should health systems be engaged with this work. So first I want to talk about what I call death gaps. You could call them life gaps, life expectancy gap, but the opportunity to live a full life. I'm going to, the second part is why as a white man, as a physician, who's been at this for so many years, over the last few years I realized it was important for me and others like me to name racism as a root cause of poor health and life expectancy gaps. Not as the only cause, but as one uh, cause in this country we have to name. And I'm going to talk about how the social determinants of health and the social determinants of inequity are two different ideas. Uh, and we're going to get into that. But I'm going to really, at the end, focus on health systems and health equity. So where you live in America, and actually pretty much across the world, dictates uh, when you die. And it's a sad fact, uh, and in many ways, the gaps between uh, the poor and the rich in this country are getting worse. This is from the Washington Post from last week. It's actually, this is available online uh, through Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, University of Washington, University of Wisconsin, that have mapped life expectancy at the census track level across the country. And if you look at uh, uh, Michigan, which I always have a little trouble finding here, but Michigan is right here. The lowest life expectancy census track in Michigan is about, six, you live to be about 60 years, and the highest around 90 years. There's a 30 year life expectancy gap in the state of Michigan. And across the United States, the biggest gap is around 35 years. And now every country has a gap, but almost no developed country has a gap like the United States. So just for the, no one like, and so in England, from the south of England to the north of England, it's about eight years, and Ireland is about four years. Uh, so these gaps exist everywhere, but uh, we, we have among the biggest. And this is from uh, another article. This was looking at the, from county to county. So we're going to end up at, we're going to be talking about Cook County and, Chick and, and uh, Berrien County, about a 20-year life expectancy gap. So this idea that place matters, where you live dictates your health, uh, when you're poor is, is the topic of this talk. We're going to get into root cause why that's true. So Ram Chetty from Stanford did a study, and it's in JAMA two years ago, 
and he looked at life expectancy across the United States, and he told us something that we know, that where, if you're rich, it doesn't matter where you live in the United States. You can live in the poorest neighborhood and be rich, and you're going to, on average, live a long life. But if you're poor, it does make a difference where you live. Uh, and what he found is that there's a 15-year, on average, life gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, but where you lived and where you were poor made a difference. So it's way better, if you want to live longer life, to be poor in New York City than it is to be in Detroit. So the poor in Detroit, there's a 15-year life expectancy gap between the, so the rich all live about the same, no matter where you live. But the poor in Detroit live 15 years less, but if you're in New York or San Francisco, 10 years less. What that tells you is public policy makes a difference, and a lot of this is local. Uh, so we can be looking to the federal government or the state government to solve the problems, but many of these problems are local, uh, and public, local public policy makes a big difference. So what we know uh, writ large uh, in the United States, in the world, and you've heard about it, the 1%, the 99%, it is true. The rich have been getting wealthier, rising income inequality up until about the 1980s. We saw the, the rise of the uh, lower class and the middle class in terms of income was going up about the same rate as the wealthy. It was a, it was a bit a rising tide was rising, raising all boats. We still had rich and poor, but people were getting better. But in the 1980s, there was a switch, uh, deindustrialization, the loss of jobs, loss of income. And it's one thing to have rich and poor, uh, a bit of a fact of the world, but the idea that you should live less because you're poor is an unacceptable proposition. It's a completely unacceptable idea that because you're poor, you're gonna die early. Um, and this is what's happened between life expectancy and U.S. Uh, wage earners. Uh, so in 1972, there was hardly any gap in life expectancy between the rich and the poor. But you can see over time, the rich are living longer because we've had advances in, uh, in all kinds of things. Uh, medicine has gotten better. You've heard of precision medicine. Who gets access to these things? You actually do better with better health care. But there's been... Uh, a very little rise in the life expectancy. In fact, if you look at the life expectancy of the lowest wage earners in the United States, the gap has actually grown over the past uh, 30 years. By the way, this is not true in Canada. So in Canada, you've seen a narrowing of the rich-poor life expectancy gap. This is really particular to the way we organize things here. Uh, so these are not accidents. These are not... Uh, uh, it didn't just rain and make this happen. This happened because of deliberate decisions we have made as communities and as a nation about uh, who lives and who dies in this country. That's the good news, because we can fix it. So I'm just going to show you Chicago for a little bit here, because this is a map uh, of what's happened in Chicago with income, and it's true in uh, Berrien County, it's true across the country. So the blue are neighborhoods in Chicago that from 1970 to 2010 saw a rise in their income, more than 20%. Uh, and Chicago has about 25% of the population making over $100,000 a year. Those blue areas along the lakefront, largely white neighborhoods of concentrated affluence. The white neighborhoods, the white neighborhoods, uh, and those are, the blue group is 21% of the town. Uh, the white neighborhoods, 23% of the census tracts, the income's neither risen nor gone down. In the red areas, 53% of the city, where income has significantly dropped 20% since 1970. So what you've seen is over half the city has gotten poor over time in Chicago. This is true across the United States. And those neighborhoods, anyone know Chicago? Those are black and brown neighborhoods. This did not happen by accident. It happened as a result of deliberate public policies that we've made. The consequences are, is a large proportion of the population are impoverished. It's true in the United States, across the United States, that if uh, you had to come up with an emergency $400 bill you had a, that you had to pay, 46% of the country would have to borrow money or sell something to come up with a $400 unexpected expense. Think about health insurance now with, for the, 
uh, through work and such, we have $5,000 deductibles. Uh, we, have, we have actually created systems that make it, we made people are poor and then we put systems on top of it that make it hard for people to access what they need. So I was a chief medical officer, I saw the stuff. Uh, it was shocking to me as a doctor to go into the lives of my patients and figure out what was going on. Uh, and, I be, and I went to my CEO and said, you know, if we're really going to improve health, we've got to think about what we're doing as a large uh, academic health system in a different way. And so we presented this map to our board of trustees. The same meeting where we uh, changed our mission from being the best in healthcare to improving health. And this is the story. The life expectancy in the Gold Coast of Chicago, where some of you may have visited, is 85. And if this were a country, it'd be ranked first in the world, think Japan. But you, but you go down the blue line, our hospital is right here, three stops past our hospital, and life expectancy plummets to under 69. And that's the life expectancy in Bangladesh. And if you ask yourself, when was the last time in the United States life expectancy in, was 69? It was 1950. Seven stops down the blue line, six miles, 70 years of life expectancy. We're going to come back to it. And our board, I'm an epidemiologist, so I know this stuff. I knew when it was under 65. But making it so, making the visible, uh, in, making the invisible visible is the first step in this work, and then asking why. So I'm a patient safety guy, and safety in a hospital has a few expressions. If you want, when the vulnerable people come into a hospital, we have to take care of them. If something goes wrong, you have to get to the root cause. And we're going to get to the root cause in a second about this. There's other things we say in patient safety. What we tolerate, we promote. So if you tolerate unsafe conditions, we're promoting unsafe conditions. And the last thing is something called just culture. If the problem is in the individual, if the individual has created the problem by their actions or by their maliciousness or failure to follow rules, then we've got to fix the individuals. But if the problem is in the way we've designed the systems, we have to fix the system. And that's true in the neighborhood as it is in the hospital. Uh, and we brought this to our board and we made health equity a strategy, and I'm going to talk about that. Because it's different to say we have community programs and we're doing this. It's another thing to say, what are we doing to address life expectancy? And we said at our board meeting that this is, the root cause of this is structural racism. First time Rush in 180 years said the words racism, 180 years. It was never written in any report, written in our community health needs assessment. The writers kept writing it out. And we said, no, write it back in because people didn't want to say the word. And economic, not disinvestment, exploitation. People have been exploited. These are afflictions. These are not accidents. Uh, and they're good people uh, yeah, in these neighborhoods. So we took it to our board, and we made equity a strategy, not a tactic. It became central to what we're trying to do as a health system. So I'm just going to give you a few, little bit more data. This is violent crime. These are homicides in the city. The west side of the city, low life expectancy, lots of homicide, you've probably heard about that. This is low birth weight, same neighborhoods uh, in Chicago. And I'm gonna now, uh, nice kid here. So here's a fact, and this was from an article by a professor at University of Michigan, Arlene Geronimus a few years ago, epidemiologist. 16 year old teenage boy on the west side of Chicago has about a 50% chance of living to the age of 65, half. So what's the reason? What's the reason? Gun violence. So I've done this, I've talked about this many times in many audiences, and when people see that, they say gun violence, because that's how our brains work. We see a black teenager, and our brains automatically go to violence. That's, that's the unconscious part of our brains. That's the unconscious part of our brains that do that. It's a form of violence. But the number one and two cause of death in this uh, neighborhood that causes premature mortality is cancer and heart disease. Right? Cancer and heart disease. Now, violence is a problem for sure, but it's not the reason. And imagine what happens in a neighborhood 
when men die early, when men are either in, uh, in jail, in prison, or they die early from cancer and heart disease, or women die, where's the wealth in that neighborhood? What happens to that? So it's a form of violence. I call this structural violence, not my term. And it's structural because it's designed into our policies, our procedures, our laws, the way we do things. And it's violent because people die as a result. And it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable, and we can't tolerate it. And so this is, the, this is you know, you name it, and you can fix it. If you don't name it, you can't fix it. So it's not just the Chicago issue. In LA, there's a 16-year life expectancy gap. You go from Fairfield County, Virginia, to Macomb County, Virginia, it's about a half-day drive, and it's a 30-year life expectancy gap. Those are both white neighborhoods. And now Michigan, I'm going to bring you to Berrien County. You heard about the life expectancy gap here. You literally drive over the bridge, over the river, and you're in a different world. It's the same one street, two worlds that I had in my experience in Chicago. And there's a 19-year life, the life expectancy gap in Berrien County is greater than the gap in Chicago. So when you think about, oh, it's people's beliefs, it's their behaviors and their biology, you got to ask yourself, as bad as it is in Chicago, why is it worse in Berrien County? Do, your, do the genes change on, down Red Arrow Highway? You know, does, it's, so you have to look at the structures and the rules and the way that we've done things. And I'd like to say this is not a right or left issue. Uh, it's not a Republican or Democrat issue. This is about right and wrong. And it's about all of us thinking about how do we solve these problems together. And it's different. Because I went to medical school, I learned about you know, physiology and how the body works and how diseases work and how things get transmitted. And I learned about people's behaviors. And just to say there's a cascade of effects uh, that where you live affects the biology of your body. And that exposure to toxic stress makes, uh, actually causes uh, ill health, no matter who you are. So I want to talk about social determinants of health and inequity. The social determinants are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider sets of forces and systems shaping daily life. So if you live in a neighborhood of concentrated poverty, if you're poor and everyone around you is poor, all of that negative effect of poverty you're, is affecting everyone around. And it's a fact in the United States that uh, why, we don't talk enough about what it's like to live in poverty. But it's true that poverty is bad for everyone, no matter where you are. But if you're a white girl, so in Chicago, for example, there are plenty of poor white people, but there's not one poor white neighborhood. So that little white girl who's poor is growing up in a neighborhood where she might have nice parks, she has a chance to go to a decent elementary school, maybe there's someone there who mentors her, maybe she goes to a sleepover at somebody's house where there's a little bit more. She has a chance to get out. And this is where we get into sort of thinking about inequity differently. So there's a lot of things that affect health. We call those the social determinants. They're not the biology of your, of your, your body and not your genetics. It's all those other things that have a giant impact on who lives and who dies. But health inequities arise it's a, by a number of different things. So imagine you're on Medicaid. Uh, and or you've been uninsured and you don't have access to health care. So now maybe you don't get your diabetes checked, your blood pressure checked. So that's going to affect your health. So access, quality of care. We know that institutions that predominantly take care of poor people don't provide the same quality of care because they don't have the same resources. I'll give you an example. The, uh, the chief medical officer of Cook County Hospital right across the street from me came to me one day, I was on the board of the public hospital, and said, David, the wait list for the eye clinic at Cook County is so long that you can go blind on the wait list. <laughs> and it wasn't because they didn't have eye doctors, good doctors, and good nurses, and good administrators. They didn't have the resources to make it happen. And yet at Rush, right across the street, you could walk in today and see the eye doctor. In, in 30 years at a safety net institution, zero of my patients ever got a transplant. Zero. And I watched them die, my patients die, for lack of access to a transplant center, kidney uh, failure and things like that. And yet the organs for the patients 
who got the uh, transplants in the uh, centers came from the intensive care unit. Patients are intensive care unit, largely black and brown patients. And then I got to Rush, and suddenly I have access to the transplant program. Sometimes it was, it was as much as people couldn't get down the street, but oftentimes there were all sorts of reasons why people didn't get the same care. But the real thing at the bottom of this iceberg is who gets exposed to these conditions. So life opportunity gaps that lead to different in health status. Who has opportunities around education, around making income and, and such? And this is where naming racism comes in, because if you look at how things get distributed in our world, uh, racism has played a disproportional uh, role in assigning black and brown people to poverty. It's not exclusively the only power dynamic. Watch the news today about Washington, D.C., about this, you know, and it's just taking away all of the hubbub about the Supreme Court thing. What you have is white boys at privileged school and white girls at privileged school and a power dynamic between boys and girls, right? That's inequities. And who feels that they have power, who can speak, when they can speak. And so these are people who are from the same class, but different genders, right? Powerful, and it takes so many years to speak. So around the tables, our power tables, there's one black person guaranteeing lots of white people, guarantee the black person's not gonna feel powerful enough to speak. And so this is, but these life eternity gaps are disproportionately assigned to uh, minority people. So racism is a key determinant of health inequities. It's not the only one, but it's one we have to pay attention to. Here's how it works in Berrien County. African Americans are seven times more likely to live in a high mortality neighborhood than a low mortality neighborhood. And those neighborhoods, I'll bet, are concentrated neighborhoods of poverty and segregation. Um, whites in Berrien County are two times more likely to live in a low mortality neighborhood than a high mortality neighborhood. There are a lot of poor white people in this county, just as there are a lot of poor uh, white people in Chicago. Turns out there are 171 cities in the United States with lots of poor neighborhoods. There's not one poor white neighborhood that's as badly off economically as any poor black neighborhood. And that's how racism works. It's not exclusively racism disproportionately racism. So here's how, so one way to ask about equity questions, how do you frame an equity question? So there's a great lens to put on things, because we would all agree that historical injustices like racism, like sexism, uh, are problematic. But what we don't want to do is perpetuate them into the present. So you put an equity lens on our policy decisions and what we're doing. You ask the question, how how is our current world organized? And does it perpetuate historical injustice that they have white on top and black on the bottom, or the wealthy on top and the poor on the bottom, or straight on the top, uh, LGBTQ on the bottom, or men on the top and women on the bottom? And it's a good lens to assess the current decisions you're making and who's around the table. So you can see here the way that it layers out in this uh, county, median uh, household income by race, is the average black family in this county makes under $22,000 a year, uh, 20, up $22,000 a year, half make less. So that's not really livable from a health perspective. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, St. Joe's, St. Joe's, I think the average uh, income is about 60,000, but you go into, uh, across the bridge and it's 22,000. So those gaps are uh, real and palpable. And here's how it's distributed by race, a little complicated graph. But you can see the black and the gr black uh, people are less likely to be distributed among the wealthier and much more likely distributed as a race among uh, the poorer under $30,000, $35,000. Uh, plenty of uh, poor white people, but more likely to be distributed up here in this range. And so uh, this shows how we're perpetuating uh, the historical injustice of racism. So naming racism, differential access to good services and opportunities of society by race. Uh, and it happens in all kinds of ways, conscious and unconscious. Racism is a system 
of structuring opportunity by assigning value based on someone looks, oftentimes occurring unconsciously. You know, this is not the frank, overt racism of old days, though that still exists. It's happening in day-to-day -day little interactions that cumulatively have an impact over a lifetime. And for white, so I'm a white man, it took many years to name racism. And part of the reason that I had trouble, I had asked myself why five times, you ask yourself why five times you get to the root cause, why it was so hard for me to name racism as a white man. You know why? Because I got to sit at the tables, the doors opened for me. Yeah, I worked hard, it was not easy. But once I got going, I got invited into the rooms, I got invited to the boardroom. And when you're sitting around that boardroom and something comes up, you know, you don't want to rock the boat, because it's kind of nice there. There's something really nice about privilege. It's very nice. And I, you don't notice it until you pay attention. So what were open doors to me were brick walls for other people. Uh, oftentimes in the room with me is one black person. And I can tell you, uh, when I have a conversation, with them, they don't feel comfortable speaking up. So white men, it's up to us and white people in general to speak up about it. Just like it's important for the men to speak up for the women, it's the me too, it's the men need to speak. White men need to speak. White men need to speak about privilege and racism. And then what do we need to do to mitigate this? So it's hard to recognize a system that privileges us. And part of our job is to make what's been invisible visible, because it's only been invisible to, to the white people. You know, it's been very visible to everyone else. Six ways that racism causes inequity. And by the way, there's many other people who are suffering, so this is not to minimize the suffering of anybody. It's, it's just that we, it's a way we have to see each other and speak about it. So the unfair concentration of black disadvantage, institutional racism, uh, in police, incarceration, hospitals, how racism gets embodied. Now, if you have mistrust, if your family has mistrust, if your historical experience has been one of mistrust, you know, you begin to embody it and act in ways uh, to, to avoid things. But then there's the, the embodiment of privilege. If I don't understand your experience, a woman coming to a doctor, uh, and you can't talk, the doctor has no experience in, say, sexual trauma and doesn't know how to inquire, are you going to say anything? No. Bias, inequality in healthcare delivery, and then inequity in health outcomes. Uh, there's been plenty of stuff written about it. Uh, Institute of Medicine just showed any place you look in healthcare delivery, there are black white differences in. Uh, what's delivered and the quality of the care uh, that's delivered. So I just want to just, picture's worth a thousand words. So an old white guy, someone like me, keeps coming to the hospital. And his wife comes with him every single visit. And she gets tired of being re uh, recognized, not as his wife, but she must be the aide. This is uh, the t-shirt she wears when she comes to my medical center, Rush Medical Center. We've made equity a strategy. This is a day-to-day, hand-to-hand combat. These are discussions we have to, but this is, I'm his wife, not his aide. Unconscious bias, right? Uh, we got involved in Chicago with looking at one cause of mortality, the difference between black and white women and who lived and who died for breast cancer. And we did this study and we showed that for white women, the mortality was dropping nicely, but for black women, it didn't move at all. And what do you think when we sh the other people in the city said when we showed this data that the cause was? Biology, genetics. And we said, no, it's structural. It's structural racism. That was a tough one to get people to change their mind over, because breast cancer in black women are, tend to be larger, more undifferentiated, and have things that make them biologically different. But that didn't get at the root cause of it. And uh, it turns out that there was no gap in New York City, or very small gap, and we had to ask the question, what happened to black women's genes when they crossed the Allegheny Mountains and came to Chicago? But, but, but most importantly, we had to, we realized it was inequality and quality. There was different quality of care at some of these institutions. And if you look to the map of Chicago and who was dying of breast cancer, the green areas are African American neighborhoods with high mortality. And the black triangles are where the hospitals were located, 
with cancer programs. And you have to say, what was it about these black women moving into these neighborhoods that didn't have resources? I'm joking. But I think this is the way we've had to tell. But I'm going to say a picture tells a thousand words with this. We actually took this and made it public. We actually were able to reduce the mortality disparity in Chicago, the only city in the country with a large black population where we've been able to reduce the gap. And we did it by going into hospitals, having them share their quality data, and then helping them improve their quality. Uh, two out of three hospitals were un not, unable to show that they met the standard in, uh, in breast cancer quality. But here as we went down and we went to train technicians in some of the hospitals how to properly do a mammogram. You see what in this picture, this is a south side, black neighborhood, safety net hospital. You see the woman, she's covering her mouth with something. What's in the middle of the floor there? A, a sewer, a sewer. Would you get your mammogram done there? Right, because no one knew that this was where they were developing the, the mammogram film. So this is struck. This is structural racism. You know, we tolerate it, and then we promote it. And you do that systematically over time, you get worse health outcomes. This black women, mothers, we know we have a national problem with maternal mortality, and it has to do with the lived experience of black women. My God, even Serena Williams uh, had a pulmonary embolism, and the doctors weren't listening to her. So being heard, being seen, being listened, there's a lot. It gets deep in here. So birth weight is different. We added up all the excess deaths. This is something you could do in Berrien County. How many excess black people die in Berrien County because they don't have the same life experience, life expecting experience as white people? We added it up in Chicago, front page of the Sun-Times, 3,200. See, we have to talk about it. 3,200, that's how many people died in 9-11, uh, once a year, every year in Chicago. How did, so asking the question, how do, does health inequity work here? So now I want to get into thinking about solutions about this. There's one, you got one point in the world for naming a problem and 100 points for fixing it. It's much, harder to, it's much easier to name than to fix. So we decided we were going to take on health equity as a strategy. We had these conversations. We continue to have these conversations. We are, we are on a journey. Uh, to try to see how can we can rectify. We've been on the west side of Chicago for 180 years. We were there before the city of Chicago was incorporated. We had to say to ourselves, we're responsible, if not accountable, for the health care outcomes. That was a big deal. That was a big deal for us today. This is actually a picture that our par community partners did of the assets in their neighborhood. Usually you see Chicago, you see the lake and the loop. This is the point of view from the west side of Chicago looking east with the life expectancy coming down the, the, uh, from here. These are the neighbor life expectancies. And these are these beautiful verdant green neighborhoods with a lot of assets. So how, do, how can health systems uh, uh, take on health equity? By the way, there's a national movement that's getting started called the Healthcare Anchor Network. 38 systems across the country are engaged in this collaborative. Hospitals are often the largest employer. Uh, with lots of relationships with business. Uh, we provide access to care through insurance and clinical locations to the underserved. Uh, we are the largest purchaser of sub, sub, large purchase, uh, purchasers of supplies. Uh, we have large reserves in most of the banks. The banks have a lot of interest in us. Uh, we have many employees from afflicted uh, neighborhoods. We actually at Rush named our employees our first community. And we wanted to ask our employees who come from these neighborhoods and looked at their uh, data. It turns out if you lived in the lowest life expectancy neighborhood, 20% of our employees take money out of their pension for hardship, uh, which is hard to do. You pay a penalty for it if you lived in that Garfield Park neighborhood. And when we asked the reasons, it was for eviction or rent. Can you imagine the stress under those low-wage employees? So we began to say, how do we make life better for our employees? And then we have an overarching responsibility for community health. It used to be that public health was out here and hospitals were here. Uh, they were originally meant to be integrated. We're reintegrating those missions, and it's really critically important we do that. So I call it an inside-outside strategy, because we've got to have an inside game within our health system, asking how is racism or sexism working right here in our medical center? That's a fun conversation to have. But you know, you use data to do it. 
you use data, you show how it worked. I was, our treasurer showed us how our employees were doing. We were shocked. We have a fantastic tuition reimbursement program, but our low wage employees couldn't access it because they had to take the money first, they had to uh, pay it first and then show they got a good grade and get the money later. They can't afford that. So we're rethinking our policies, even what the base wage should be here. So it's critical to be a strategy versus a tactic. So in Russia, it was endorsed by board, led by senior leaders. We decided that we had to accelerate diversity, inclusion, and leadership, because at the rate we're going, in 100 years, uh, we'll look like the wet rest of Chicago. And that wasn't fast enough. And, but by the way, uh, I've asked the question, how, what proportion of uh, uh, black voices would we need in the room for people to feel comfortable speaking up to white power? Uh, it's about half. Uh, and we, so you can't have one person or two people or three people. You'd need more voice around the table. By the way, we make better decisions when we're inclusive. We've started to screen our patients and partner with communities to treat the social and structural determinants of health. We were shocked when we started screening our patients. 30% had food insecurity. And if, we never thought of ourselves as how do we solve the problem of food, but if you have diabetes and you don't have food, uh, that's, that's a problem. So we are screening and we're trying to figure it out. We name the root causes and talk about it like we're talking here, structural races, economic and edu educational deprivation. So if it's largely economic and educational, well, those are things we can work on. <coughs> We've identified the, uh, ways to build wealth um, among our low-wage employees through lots of different things. I'll talk about a little bit our, about our career pathways. So we, just, we had this idea, say, my God, people are coming into our institution as a transporter, as an environmental service worker, and 30 years later, they're retiring into poverty. And we started to have those conversations and say, do, if we are the number one employer in the United States and healthcare is, what are the paths that we're giving to our own employees for career paths? And we've done an IT career path, but I want to tell you about the medical assistant career path. So we decided we were going to launch one. This was pretty re recently, because medical assistants are in high demand. And, uh, but I said, my God, no one's going to want to be a medical assistant. That's hardly, that's hardly a big job, but it's a first step. So we had 35 positions. Now to reorganize HR to be able to do career paths was not, a bit, was not easy. But on the other hand, we partnered with the community college. Everything is paid for through various different grants and stuff. We opened it for a week and we had 300 applicants for 30 positions, 300. But the most poignant part of it is I work in my clinic, in my office, our front desk person, uh, Stephanie, was one of the people picked. And she talked to me, and she's like about 40, she never went to college. This is an opportunity to get college credit. She may want to go on to be a nurse. She said, she cri I cried. I cried when they picked me. Think about, though, from a rush perspective, employee engagement. So we see real benefits in this. You know, workforce coming to rush. We've had more applicants to rush for medical school since we took on this community strategy. It's the place to be. Uh, in Chicago. It's one of the places because of what we're doing. We, or, so w whether you, hospitals, whether they like it or not, are anchor institutions in our communities. But it's one thing to do it accidentally, and it's another thing to do it intentionally. And so we're doing it very, very intentionally. What does it mean, and it's on our corporate dashboard, percent local hires from these neighborhoods? How the construction jobs, we have a whole dashboard of things that we're doing. We work to identify and eliminate health outcome gaps, which means we have to look at our own data within our own health system and ask the question, who's thriving and who's not thriving within our own population? Do our health outcomes replicate historical injustices? Meaning, are our white patients doing better than our black patients? Are our men doing worse or better than our women? It means we have to organize our own healthcare data, and it's illuminating when you do it, because you find areas that weren't, you weren't even thinking about concentrating on. Uh, so we've, uh, we're doing this. We're partnering with community groups, hospitals, uh, and uh, the business community uh, to address these gaps. And you have a great situation with a big corporation, Whirlpool, with a great health system, Lakeland, together, uh, even the health department that's very oriented around this. And we talk in many forums about what we mean by equity. So we can explain it, so people understand it, so we get comfortable having these courageous conversations with each other. 
So we, we put together a uh, collaborative to address the life expectancy gap. And the big goal is to decrease the life expectancy gap, big, hairy, audacious goal, by 50% by 2030. And when we put it out there, some of our hospital partners said, we can't say that. We're not in the business of doing community of life expectancy gap. And our community partners from the neighborhood said, wait a second, that's hardly enough. So we have, you know, the discussions have been pretty incredible. But we said by 2030, because we want to say we're in this for the long haul. We're not, this is not, because there's, we have well-earned mistrust with the community, by the way. We've earned it over many, many years. And that we have to overcome that mistrust by showing up, by uh, following the lead of the community. And the goal of this uh, is to build community health, economic wellness, and build healthy, vibrant neighborhoods. You actually have a much easier job than we have, because there's about 500,000 people on the west side of Chicago. It's bigger than Miami. It's bigger than Cleveland. Uh, you actually have 150,000 people in this county. You have about 30,000 people who are in this, this sort of very low income zone. You could put your arms around it. And we'd love to learn from you, by the way, uh, because this is no one, this is not, there are no short-term answers to this, but by God, we can do this. Uh, and so this is our approach to it, and we're going to do it by not just doing traditional health care, but look at education, economic vitality, the physical environment, and using a cross-sector place-based strategy. Everyone in. And like I said before, it's not about left or right. It's not about Republicans and Democrats. I pointed in Chicago to everyone who says, well, what about the federal government? What about the state government? I said, listen, this has all been under Democrats. This is Obama's hometown. So it's always been our job to fix this. No one else's. I'm not saying public policy doesn't make a difference. It does. But it's always been our job to fix it. And, and the big, hairy, audacious aim we've taken to the board, we've taken to the newspapers, we're going to do this. And to put yourself out there as a health system with something like that, you know, what do we say, go big or go home? Well, this is home. No place else to go. This is our home. We live here. Uh, so it's, the other thing we do is we frame this collaborative as a racial health equity collaborative. And this was a deliberate discussion, and the governance was first the hospitals and the business groups, and now we're changing our governance to make sure there's an equal voice with community leaders on this uh, collaborative. This was very important to say this, because when I get up and our CEO, it took our CEO many years, but he's come to it where he actually says the word structural racism. And it's really good that he says it, because it's important for those, just like sexism, we need to defend women, men, uh, and we need to speak uh, tr truth about what's happening. It doesn't fix it by saying it, but at least it says we have an understanding. So it's holistically address these social and structural determinants, unified community voice, measure, 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 don't do things, means don't do things if they're not working. We've all had programs, we've invested money in, they don't work, stop doing them. Right? But do the things that work. Do the things that work. I, I like to say community-led. So there's an expression, nothing about us without us. It comes from the disability community. Community-led. We did impact investing. So investing, 180 years we never invested in the west side of Chicago in an intentional way. We started doing it. First we did it as Rush. Now we've done it with three hospitals. And when we did it with three hospitals, we had three hospitals, four community leaders, sitting in a community-based organization in that lowest life expectancy neighborhood. And what they could tell us about what to invest in was so much better than the investors could tell us. So trust the voice of the community. Don't be afraid to be led. Share power, and that's a critical, been a critical piece of this. Lots of work streams, I'm not gonna go into it, but you know, uh, we figured out the governance for this. We have, all our institutions have projects, uh, but we're really thinking about how do we holistically do this over the long term. So I wanna just talk about the listening tours. We have spent a lot of time investing in listening. And as a white man, doctor, I don't listen so good. But we have people who actually go out and record what people are saying. So we went to the west side of Chicago 
and said, <clears throat> what are your priorities? We thought people would say gun violence. Violence. They didn't say violence at all. They said, what do you want? Improved access to high paying jobs. Not $12 an hour, not $13 an hour. You know, when we looked at our own employees, when did they stop from an epidemiologic perspective? We knew that our um, low-wage employees are experiencing financial distress. We can see all kinds of signals for it, one of which is taking money out of pension prematurely, that 20% rate. We asked, at what dollar per hour did our employees stop, and you can look at it within your own institution, stop taking money out of a pension, which is an emergency act to do, what dollar per hour did they stop doing it? $22 an hour, that's about $44,000 a year. It doesn't mean they're not in financial distress, but we know that well-paying jobs make a difference. That's what we heard from the community. We need help with economics and jobs. There are a lot of hiring bearers. Uh, support for community businesses. So we've started to figure out how do we lever our supply chain to start supporting in very, very specific ways community businesses that could use a boost. You know, and, not, and so it means moving suppliers around and getting down and dirty about your supply chain. Hospitals don't make a lot of money, but they use a lot of stuff. Food, people do the laundry, and other things like that. And we're thinking very deliberately, how do we place things that supply our business in these neighborhoods? Uh, the third was, our youth are feeling hopeless. Our children are feeling hopeless. Uh, the fourth was mental health. We're experiencing a huge amount of stress. People are going crazy. We don't have the support for this in our neighborhoods. We need you to do this. We were never organized as a, as a health system. We have a great psych unit. You know, you're mentally ill, you're, you're ready, suicidal, come to us. But for the day-to-day post-traumatic stress sorts of things, that people, or actually current traumatic stress, not even post, people needed help. And we've tried to reorganize ourselves around community mental health. Uh, in, in a way to serve the needs of the community and co-locate some services in community-based organizations. We were never in this business. It's not a money-making business, but we're in it now and we're trying to figure it out. Uh, greater access to oral health care, safe outdoor spaces for physical activity, and greater access to healthy food. This is what the community told us, and not one thing on gun violence. And guess what? It's what everybody wants, right? You want a safe neighborhood, you want good jobs. We're not asking for a lot of money, but enough to live without the pressures. Our kids not to be hopeless. So it's been very helpful. So this is some of the, our you know, community meetings we've had, the listening tours, the engagement around it. Um, so the anchor mission is deliberately now aligning ourselves as an institution to be community oriented, hiring locally and developing talent. Uh, so a lot of the degrees you need for entry-level jobs, someone made up one day. Now, some of them you need degrees, but what we found is, is you know, some jobs just need a high school degree. So we have electronic medical records. We have Epic. I don't know what you use here, but they're all highly costly. To get probably someone to come up to St. Joe's to be an IT tech consulting probably costs $80 an hour. We figured out a way to train high school kids, all black and brown kids, from neighborhood high schools in tech, in technology. And we sent them to Epic. We went to Epic and said, you must train them. When they went up to Epic, sent 40 kids to Epic. They were the only black and brown kids up in Verona, Wisconsin. They got certified on how to actually do the work on the electronic medical record. We hired some of them as apprentices at Rush at $30 an hour while in junior college. And, and if they go work for Epic, they make 60 bucks an hour. All we needed to do was lay down the path into the high school in the African-American neighborhood and turn hopelessness into hope. And when people see that they have a future for them, one of the kids uh, said, you know, before I engaged, I didn't see a future for myself. And when people see a future for herself, she's in IT now, but she's going to become a nurse practitioner. Now, the question is, how do we scale that? That's the question. How do we scale it in a way? This has to be sustainable, by the way. Actually, giving people a chance to earn good wage and then filling jobs with it, that's a good sustainable methodology. But 
it, it wasn't that hard, but it required a reorganization, buying and sourcing locally. So one of the things we're doing is, hospitals do a lot of laundry and we feed a lot of people, but what if we did the, all of this in a neighborhood? And so we're thinking about creating a workers' co-op, the workers own it, uh, we asked, Cleveland did this, you need 10 million pounds of laundry to make a laundry work. And we asked around our colleagues and we got 30 pounds of laundry, 30 million pounds of laundry. So we can build a sustainable laundry and have it be uh, ultimately worker owned where people can make up to $20 an hour over time. That's what they've done in Cleveland. We're trying to replicate that in Chicago. It's just thinking differently about the economics of our uh, of our healthcare system. By the way, why do we need to be first? Because we have a moral ethical mission. We're here, our capital is in this neighborhood. A big corporation, though I don't think Whirlpool would ever do this, can just roll out, they can become transnational. Our capital sits here. Why don't, why our business, why do the businesses lag? Because why would you go into a neighborhood if you thought it was bad? Why would you make an investment in a neighborhood if you thought it was bad? And when we collectively hold these ideas that neighborhoods are bad, uh, of course a business won't go into it. So we need to pull the businesses and our business partners in with us, led by the community. So the investment locally I told you about, and we've actually done things to get our own folks, uh, largely people like me with this pigmentation, to go into neighborhoods they've never gone into because these are vital neighborhoods. People love their neighborhoods, but they don't like the narrative that's been made about the neighborhoods. So these are just, we have 10 initiatives, but these are some of the ones we're doing. So we're taking on behavioral health and co-location and not just putting more healthcare resources, but how do we like hire community health workers and social workers to help in these neighborhoods working with community-based organizations. Let's think through the job piece of it. What about reducing the, uh, we did a whole analysis about food access, and there's a big gap, of course, between the north side of Chicago and the west side, so we have a strategy that we're all taking on, all, everyone signed on to it, that we're going to reduce the food gap, the food access gap. And then we say, big, hairy, audacious goal, what if, Every high school kid on the west side of Chicago could get a summer job in mentorship, facilitated by us. We're doing about 500 right now, and there's 20,000. But you start with the number, and you say, how are we gonna do it? We got lots of partners, we got lots of law firms, we got a lot of accounting firms. We found we could put students with our nurses and with our PCTs on our loading dock and they get mentored. And if they can imagine the mentorship all through high school and then measuring the college race, because almost all of our kids go to college. And that's the path out. But imagine big, audacious goals uh, led by the health system. So that's what we're doing. And again, uh, with a life expectancy goal. So <clears throat> this is the uh, picture of what the future looks like. This was uh, created by our planning partners, our community leaders from these different neighborhoods. And what you see here is a complicated picture, but there's West Side United uh, sign right here with all the neighborhoods uh, together, people laying down this bridge here. Uh, what you can see is the pillars are long-term investment, equal opportunity, uh, advocacy, policy. Down here are the healthcare institutions, the community members. Uh, here are the storm clouds the bridge is being built over. It says systematic racism. Now we can say the word, right? No one died. I said racism like 50 times, no one died. Uh, disinvestment, short-term focus. And the future headlines of Chicago Tribune. So the one on the right here, life expectancy of the west side rises to that of the loop, because that's the goal, equal health. And then the other one, changing the west side story from violence to victory. So, you know, this is kind of everybody in, nobody out, being led by the community, uh, not being afraid to make the long-term investment. And I'm gonna end on this is, you know, it's really important that we change the narrative, that we use data about it, that it be sustainable. And my CEO was asked uh, at a meeting, what's your biggest fear? What's your biggest fear? And his answer was, which I really appreciate, because it tells me that he totally gets this now, if we don't close the gap fast enough, if we lose the trust 
of the community around us. His biggest fear wasn't that we would lose money. His biggest fear was if we didn't maintain and gain the trust of the community and show that we're making a difference. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a few questions. I know I have um, my colleagues next to me had want to jump the line a little bit. You have a question that you want to ask? Okay. okay. Jump the line. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. What a pleasure and a gift uh, to our community. Um, what advice would you, I know you had a ton of insights and action steps right away that we can take. I love the Epic idea that really, um, you know, taking the kids to Epic for, for training. What do you think would be a good first step um, for our leaders at Lakeland to consider? All right, I say, one of, so what are the insights? So we've been at this for two years. First of all, I'm, I, I'm so impressed with Lakeland, I will tell you, uh, that, they've, that you've embarked on thinking through this, because there are very few places I know in the country that have, are thinking through this. So while we're all behind, uh, you're actually doing the critical thinking about what this uh, takes. So the most, I, I want to say when I, we look back and I talk to Larry Goodman, our CEO, and we say, my God, I didn't realize this was going to take off like it did. And it's really taking off. We're getting a lot of attention around it, as will you, when people know what you're doing. But number one was getting our board engaged with this as a strategy and having the conversations about root cause and racism. Because when, what it did for us, it was finally an honest conversation. And it didn't mean that we've eliminated racism uh, or rush. I showed you the woman with the shirt. Uh, we're struggling with it every day. But that was critical first step, making it a strategy, not a tactic, because this is long term. These are many, many years in coming. Uh, we can't do it by ourselves. Uh, we're not the whole solution to it. So that was number one. Number two is looking at our, our employees as the first community, because these are the people we see every day. Hank the transporter. You know, the person you say hi to. And when you know that someone's suffering near you and you start listening to their stories, it made us think about what are our internal policies that we could align and why we needed to be some urgency around career pathway. So that was number two. Number three is having, having the faith that allowing the community leaders to lead us and power share, really think about power share. We had the discussion of the governance. Do you have an advisory committee? This is a big deal. Do you have an advisory committee and the community advisory committee? Or do you have the community with an equal voice in governing the efforts? Or actually, I say a plus one voice. And uh, after a lot of, we have uh, seven healthcare institutions doing this together in the west side of Chicago. We have lots of healthcare institutions. This has never happened, the healthcare institution. Talk about trust and mistrust, one hospital versus another. You don't have that challenge here, thank goodness. But to get the trust of the hospitals first around the table, and then to get them to all agree that the community voice would be a majority of the board that's governing this. Uh, so that was, that was important. And then the initiatives, like where do you start? You start from your data. So you have data. You know what, you know, you're doing your community health needs assessment, but you start through also what's important to the community. So that's what I would say. It's, but I'm saying is, you know, we're going to fail. We're not going to succeed at everything, but let's fail together. Let's fail forward. Let's have honest conversations. It's going to get emotional at times, but we'll get through it. Uh, but I think what's really remarkable about this is the positive uh, regard that for an institution that's been around for so long and has so much mistrust that the community has given us for trying this. Thank you. Um, earlier today um, in your CME, you talked about dashboards that you were using. Can you talk a little bit about some of the metrics that you're using to track your yeah. evolution? Well, it's been an interesting process of trying to think of these. 
you know, hosp hospitals measure everything. So hospitals in general have the margins of grocery stores. You know, there are some rich hospitals in this country, but most hospitals are not rich. Very, very low margin, and it makes the boards and the management nervous about taking on a social mission. You know, like social determines of health. Oh my God, that's not our job to do. But we've come up with a way to begin to measure each one of these things. What we're trying to do is tie it to community health yet, and we're working on, like, what are the intermediate measures that are gonna tell us we're getting to a long-term measure of life expectancy? So we first started with things like percent hiring from certain very, very specific zip codes, something we never looked at before. And then, first of all, we, we've had to look at all of our data and look at it from who are we hiring for what jobs and why. And then with the idea that we're going to intentionally uh, look at those communities. We partner with community-based organizations because we don't have the skill. So the many ex-returning uh, citizens, ex-offenders, they're hard necessarily to hire in healthcare, but we can do it. But you need help with community-based organizations. But we made metrics around that, and we track them actually monthly. Mm. We've done uh, measures around impact investing and the social impact of that impact investing. So uh, we, we did uh, invested, and this is for, here's the other thing that was very interesting, this issue of leverage around this. So we track our impact investments, but we found that if we put a million dollars into a project, suddenly we could get the banks and others to put a lot of money in. We had a huge amount of leverage because the regard and respect that healthcare has in a community, and we could leverage that. So we are actually measuring social impact of our investments and the collateral impact of our investments uh, on other things. So that's the type of things we do. We look at construction hiring, and we're doing pathway measurements uh, as well. I, I will say we're very early into this. We've been in the material part of it for a little bit over uh, a year and a half. Someone's asked uh, whether you collaborate with Meals on Wheels. Okay. Uh, we have some Meal on Wheel collaborate, but we're thinking food in a big, we're thinking food in a big way. So this was an interesting thing. The community really wanted us uh, to take on food uh, and, and food access. And there's some systems that have done it very well. ProMedica in, in uh, Toledo has taken on food uh, as a strategy, and they're a partner in this healthcare anchor network. So we're thinking food in a big way, and there's six different uh, pieces under this strategy. Uh, and one of them is, access to specific foods that can be delivered like Meals on Wheels, but some of it is what we found is there's a big gap of people who are eligible for food benefits but aren't getting them. Mm -hmm. And so that that's a gap, so you don't think about that, you know, the uh, SNAP benefits and other things like that. We're looking at uh, uh, things like how is a health system that we can deliver food in some way, shape, or form through partnerships like Meals on Wheels. So we're just in the beginning of uh, rolling out that strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you say to people who suggest that gun violence should be your first priority, as opposed to other social determinants of health? Yeah, it's, uh, we've had that up here in Chicago. We've had that discussion. Uh, you know, it, these are called wicked problems. The problems we're trying to solve, they're deeply, they're long-term, deeply bed in society multiple interweaving strings. You don't know what, sh what to tug on first uh, or not. And so the, our approach to this is that it has to be multi-sector, uh, multi-partner. And certainly reducing violence uh, is going to be one of it. But believe me, gun violence is the tip of an iceberg of all of the violence that's going on. There's interpersonal violence, there's sexual trauma, uh, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, so it's hard to know what should come first. We allowed the voice of the community to tell us. So how do you, when you have a complex, wicked problem, which you don't know what the big, you know, ball of string and you're trying to undo it, we decided that we were going to follow the voice of the community and what the community, from the listening tours and the community leaders, what they said we should start first, and they didn't say violence. And had they said we should take on gun violence first, I would have been here telling you we're taking on gun violence first. They said jobs. <laughs> they said support our local businesses. They said co-location of mental health services uh, and other things like that. And that's what we're doing. Mm. And uh, I think that's the way you in engender trust. We think violence is a symptom of the larger root causes and will follow. Okay. 
Uh, there was a question about uh, the role of local, state, and federal government in helping to eliminate these health inequities. Yeah. Okay, I, when I gave this talk to the business community, and I said, uh, do you, anyone want to venture what the uh, trust level is? There's something called the Edelman, Edelman Trust Barometer. You can Google it. The trust level in the Trump presidency. Anyone want to guess? 17%. You know what it was for Obama? 17%. <laughs> we are a country that doesn't trust government. And hospitals are about 60%. We're not as good as we knew. There's a lot of well-earned mistrust that we've earned with you. We've earned a lot of mistrust with you, but we're better. And I think the community is willing to give us a break. So I actually think there's a role of government. So when we're trying to do this, we say, okay, who should convene this table? We didn't want to be the ones that convened it. Someone else should convene the table. Uh, and the health department couldn't convene the table. So it turned out for us, it's a private-private partnership. It was, the, it was the hospitals, the business community, convening the table first, and then being willing to allow the community to share power and lead. That's how it worked with, with, with actually government agencies at the table, and that's how it works. So there is a big role, public policy makes a big difference. But if you, you know, I think your state hasn't done so well, like our state hasn't done so well. Do you I mean there's not a lot of trust? But guess what, we trust each other. Or sometimes we trust each other. But we have to see each other every day, you know? We have to see each other in our communities. And there's a lot of power in this. Listen, we're, in, we're America, for God's sakes. We've done a lot of incredible things. This is within our capabilities. This is not as hard as it seems to do. What's, what we've failed, what, where we failed in this is being brave enough to think big enough and being brave enough to convene a table and then move forward with humility as, a large, as large organizations. Um, and this community can really do it because you've got, I think, a really strong business community and a really strong health system. Uh, and you don't have, you know, we're, we're trying to bring them all together. It's a little more complicated where we are. Um, actually, building on that, someone has asked, how do you start a conversation about racism in places where people benefit from the system of racism and, and yeah. okay. inequality? Yeah. Let me just say this. Uh, I, I just say a little bit of my personal background. My parents were immigrants to this country, and my mother's family was wiped out in the Holocaust. They were victims of racism, mass incarceration, and genocide. And coming to this country as a, as a white kid in the civil rights movement and seeing that, saying, you know, I, I'm going to, to, my life has to be focused on justice. That's just got to be the arc of my life. I have a compelling family uh, history, and self-preservation tells me that's important. But, you know, these are systems that were designed for a reason. If it didn't benefit, if it didn't benefit us to keep it going, we wouldn't keep it going but largely it's also on autopilot. So the, one of the ways you, you change the autopilot of it is by how, how do we change those of us who've been, gotten to the seats of power? We've gotten to the seats of power not because we've done bad things, because we've done good things, but now we're in power. How do we actually reframe the discussion so our institutions don't perpetuate it and we can show how we're not going to do it? So one of it at Rush, Part of the discussion as we were doing on this, our, our black and brown employees and leaders said, you know, we need to accelerate diversity and inclusion here. And that means at the board level, it means at the leadership level, uh, and that means women as well as men. It means, uh, you know, because if we don't accelerate those voices around the table, we're not going to get to it. But, but I think we have to decide to take it on. I don't think we've ever organized ourselves in a way as a society that we're going to take it on uh, and make it different going forward. I'm not saying it's easy. It's been here for this is 400 years uh, in the making. Uh, in the beginning of time, we've had sexism, right? Uh, w women uh, hold up more than half the world for about 70% of the pay. You know, so we have a long way to go on this. But the intention, we've never done it with the kind of intentionality as institution. And if we can show through metrics that we're making progress, that brings optimism that we can actually finally overcome this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have one more question, and maybe take one from the audience. I think you've addressed this partially, but I've been asked, um, where do we start in Benton Harbor? 
Where did what? Where do we start this whole journey? Where, what is the starting part, point for addressing these issues vis-a-vis -vis Benton Harbor? I mean, you, you talked okay. about educating uh, kids, taking them to Epic, and you've given us a few uh, You know ideas. what, I just think you gotta admit, you gotta, so first you gotta admit you have a problem, right? Just say, we got a problem. Two, we gotta talk about it. And then gonna say, and you have to say, I am accountable. We are accountable for this. And, and that's where it starts. Everything, and that's how life works. And, uh, then you just take the steps to do it. Uh, so I, that's, what, that's what my right. approach But guess what, you know, I've always been uh, with this stuff. I've always had the option, I've worked in great healthcare organizations. It's been my career. I've always believed uh, in these organizations because they're essentially moral uh, institutions. Yeah, we have to, it's a business. We have to make money. We have to in, reinvest in our business. But they're moral institutions. Mm -hmm. What this has done for our institution uh, has been tremendous. So, the, you know, the, you, you say there's the business of what we do every day, but then there's the hearts and minds. You know, it's that voluntary discretionary effort that our, our employees, our boards, everyone takes on. When you take on something like this, uh, admit that you don't, that we, we have a problem, we don't quite know how to solve it, but we're willing to take it on. The, the hearts and minds of the organization will rise to help you solve the problem. Our employees have been absolutely tremendous, especially the employees who come from these neighborhoods who can tell us what it is we need to be doing. And I think it's, so I would start, I would start there, and I think there's, you know, the road is long and the outcome's a long way away, but there's milestones along the way. But uh, it's, we've been surprised I think, uh, at the degree of enthusiasm mm -hmm. for this is the right thing right now in this country mm -hmm. to fix these problems locally. Actually, a bunch of questions just jumped up, but I'll just do one more. Uh, someone asked if you engage any consultants in this work. <clears throat> consultants, that's a, a very long <laughs> four-letter word in healthcare <laughs> and anywhere. You know, this, this was a private, private, this started as a private, private partnership uh, between the Commercial Club of the City of Chicago and Rush University Medical Center. And uh, the business community has been, in, the business community in Chicago has bought into this because, you know, people are trying to, re, the business community is trying to recruit execs and staff to Chicago to come work, trying to get Amazon to come to Chicago. Well, if the, if the narrative in the city is of the, that of a divided city, how do you recruit people to come? So we had the business community uh, on board with it, and we've worked with a group called Civic Consulting Alliance that comes out of the commercial club, and they're, they've generally, generally done consulting for the city and other folks like that. And we've actually been able, and I'm sure with the relationship with Whirlpool, is get bo pro bono consultants to come in to help us think through a problem. So the food strategy problem, you know, usually you would say, well, food strategy, we'll get the food bank in and we'll get the public health department in. We actually got McKisson in and they helped us organize in two months what a food strategy will be for the west side of Chicago. All of the institutions signed on enthusiastically and now we're pursuing the money to do it. So we have used, we've used in a non-traditional way pro bono business consultants to help us take on a thorny idea, a difficult idea, like workforce, how do you create a workforce pathway in a hospital that's trying to do this? So we've actually quite successfully used uh, pro bono, we haven't paid for one consultant, uh, mm -hmm. to help us think through these ideas. Okay, well thank you. Thank you very much for thank coming. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you'll stick around for a few more questions. Um, but I do wanna tell people kind of what's gonna be happening in the next few months. Uh, in January, March, and May, we're going to be screening uh, episodes of Unnatural Causes. Um, hopefully you have this flyer so that you can see what episodes we're going to screen. The first one will be, um, it's going to be an interesting comparison between the health effects of an, an appliance company shutting down its uh, manufacturing facilities in Sweden and in Michigan. That's going to be interesting. When the next one, we're going to look at um, how racism become, becomes embodied in the body and maternal health outcomes. 
And then we're going to look at uh, the third one will um, address the distribution of wealth and how that impacts health. And then next July, which you will have many, many um, reminders, we're going to host the Chief Community Officer of Kaiser Foundation Health Plan and Hospitals. Um, and he will be here talking about what Kaiser Permanente is doing in, in the area of population health and community health. So with that, I thank you so much. You've given us so much to work with, and I'm looking forward to working with you and co-learning. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me.